Good afternoon. Some people sing in the bath, some people just think. Did you ever think, I wonder where this sponge I'm using came from? There's a small Greek island called Simi, not far from Turkey, where one of the traditional activities was diving for that very sponge. But things are changing for Simi. The 20th century is bearing down on it, and we'll be discussing in the studio the question of adapting shortly. But first, Simi, an idyllic place caught in old times but facing new pressures. <laughs> beautiful island of Simi. It is situated between Rhodes and the Turkish coast and seems almost untouched by the social and economic advances of the rest of Europe. On the contrary, the fabric of its traditional economic life shows signs of falling apart. One reason for this breakup is that its main industry, diving for natural sponges, has been undercut by the manufacture of cheaper plastic alternatives. Another is Simi's economic rivalry with neighboring Turkey, a country which has had an undue influence upon its history. The Turks launched a number of attacks on these islands, and the Simiots beat off two attacks. And then in 1522, they knew there was a third attack coming, and they decided they weren't going to make it through that one. So rather than fight, they negotiated for the best terms that they could get. Unlike Rhodes, which was conquered and suffered uh, rather badly from that, but the Simiots negotiated the surrender, and in return for acknowledging Turkish suzerainty, and paying an annual tribute, the Maktut. They were granted a number of special privileges. They were allowed complete freedom of their own affairs, as long as it didn't conflict with Turkish interests. They were made a free port, and they became an important trading center, and before the days of steam, an important bunkering port. And most importantly of all, they were given sponge fishing rights throughout the Ottoman Empire and eventually the Ottoman Empire took in all of North Africa. So that meant half the Mediterranean, and they built their wealth on the sponge trade, merchant trading, bunkering. This is not knowledge, this is a personal theory, but uh, the houses are rather Italianate in style. And I know that Venice used to be the world clearing center of the sponge trade. So they would have had a lot of trade with Venice. And I can't help wondering whether they didn't bring back architectural ideas from there. This architecture in Simi is, we call it, is the neoclassical Greek architecture, the island is protected from the archaeological institution of Greece and you are not allowed to build up any big building or big hotel. You have to rebuild the house as it was. And you have to get a license from the archaeological institution of Greece. It's very, very hard to build a toilet in Simi. You need uh, to get a license, you need three, four years. It is ironic that the community's loss of its trading power followed by poverty and the inevitable mass migration of its people, has created the only unspoilt island in the region. And this has brought the inevitable mass immigration of tourists. During the war, the, the, the Germany bomber after the English bomb, may, many of these houses, not the bomb, it's when people live, see me, they're so poor, and I don't have money to pay the ticket to go in Australia or in America or in Africa, they sell all the windows, 
all the the roof, the tiles, and all this with er erosion, with the rain, many houses destroyed like this. I don't sell because it's uh, for sentimental uh, question. No? It's difficult to sell something is from your father or from your mother, and. Uh, I think it's the same in England. Eh? When you receive something from your father, you don't sell quickly. Eh? A lot of people kept their houses, and often it's a problem because um, the original people may have emigrated many years ago. They have died not making any will about the house, so it is therefore jointly divided between their children, possibly now between their grandchildren, and that makes the legal side of property transfer very difficult, because you may find that the house is jointly owned between a dozen people scattered round the world. They all have to give their agreement to the sale. Older and more traditional Simeons could not and would not abandon a culture older than that of Western Europe. Nor would they give up a livelihood which had served their families for many generations. Their culture and their industry were inextricably bound together. Our whole life used to be sponges. The whole community, in some way, made its living from them. I remember a time when you walked down the street, you couldn't move for people. You couldn't find a chair in the cafe. The whole place was full of people. The population then was 15 or 16,000. Now it's about 4,000. Minola started diving for sponges as a seven-year-old. The people round the harbour say that he was able to dive unaided to 50 feet and stay there for over six minutes. That was before his accident. As a diver, this stone was your life. You would tie this rope to the boat at one end and the stone at the other. You hold the stone like this and move it round like a steering wheel and it steers you through the water. If you hold it like this, you go down slowly. And if you want to go through the water quickly, you hold it like this. The rope was about 70 or 80 meters long and was also tied to your wrist. So if something happened, the men in the boat could pull you up. I was diving off roads. Everyone knows about the massive rocks on the shore of roads. But it's the same under the sea. So it is a good place for sponges, but more dangerous than here. I was gathering sponges and I suddenly felt something was wrong. Maybe it was the pressure. Maybe I was diving too deep. Somehow I let go of the stone, and as they pulled me up, the stone got stuck on a rock. All I can remember is waking up in hospital. God alone knows how I got out of the sea alive. When I came out of hospital, I was told I could never dive again. There was something wrong with me but I don't know what. What was I supposed to do? Diving for sponges was the only thing I knew. With a friend, I used to go collecting shellfish on the rocks. But after a while, I started diving again, in secret. But I couldn't dive to any depth. The only way I could make a living was to collect rubbish and clean toilets. Dimitri Ionaki remembers that when he was a boy, before the days of pumps and compressors, Menolas and the other young men of the village could only reach the sponges by free diving. 
The diver with the stone would be completely naked. They would smooth the stones themselves. There's quite an art to it and would always use the same stone. The stone was almost like a part of their own body. They would dive 20, 30, sometimes 40 times a day. My father was a soldier in the war and we didn't have help from anyone. Life was difficult, but as we boys got older, it was easier. We had a little money from our grandfather, and as I got older, maybe 13 or 14, I, I started diving for sponges and could help support the family. I started diving in 1951, carried on for nine years. We always went out in the boat with the same group of men. The diver had a different wage to the crew, though. Each diver would take a percentage of the sponges that he collected, say, 50%. Of course, each grade of sponge had its own price. The first grade, which grows very deep in the water, would fetch maybe 900 drachmas. The lowest grade may be only 300 drachmas. If you were courageous and strong, you could make a good living. The sponge is beautiful when you see it in the water. It is like a plant, and it is black. There are wild sponges and tame sponges. The divers can recognize them immediately. To us, it is like recognizing a man from a woman. If you don't know the difference, then you just touch it gently. And if the skin comes off, it's a wild sponge. They beat the sponge, either with a stone or against a rock. And a milky substance comes out because the sponge is alive. It's like a plant. It's like a tree. You, you cut it and the next year it grows again. And then you prune it again and so on. Semi was not totally isolated from the great advances being made in the rest of Europe and America. For the Simiots were great traders and travelers and brought back new ideas and techniques from abroad. Dmitri Sikarsis' grandfather was one such trader and returned from France with a more advanced diving mechanism, which Mr. Sikarsis and his family manufacture on the island to this day. There is an old family here, and the grandfather, Basil Mastoridis, who is a bit of a legend, left the island to work for a French salvage company, salvaging wrecks near South Africa, India, all over the world. He couldn't believe the machinery they had. So he bought a machine like this, which could go down in the water to 20 meters, and then another one which could go down to 40 meters. They brought the machinery to us, and we adapted them to go to greater depths. We then took it to the ministry for approval, and from then on we manufactured it here. All the things you see here, we manufactured on the island. We were always a close community in Simi. The idea was always that the wealth we had from the sponges would benefit the whole Simian population. In the beginning, we started with the naked diver and the stone, and that continued for centuries. Then the divers started to use a kakua, which is a blue metal rod attached to a rope which made collecting the sponges easier. Then Basil Mastoridis brought the salvage machines to sea. I remember to begin with, no one would go down in the machine. They were too scared. So Basil went home and fetched his wife, who was three months pregnant. He dressed her in a diving suit with a metal helmet, and he made her go down five or six feet and pulled her up again. The divers, who were all standing there watching, thought, if a woman can do this, so can we. 
The war was really the turning point. We couldn't dive for the sponges and we couldn't sell them. After the war, we started again. But then the plastic sponge was introduced and the price of the natural sponge dropped very dramatically. One American in America who was in Tarpon Spring in America, who was importing sponges from Simi, one day he put in his bath a plastic cover to cover, cover his bath, the hot water not to become cold. And the water get so hot, so in the plastic went into his sponge, and when he got it out, he found the first pattern of a plastic sponge. And that was a very big, bad thing for the sponges, because they create the first plastic sponges in the world. He was a simian. The sponge is not a plant, but an animal. And it grows from a little worm. It is like a plant in that you can cut it and it grows again. When you take it out of the water and you don't cure it, if you just leave it in its natural state, it smells and you can't go near it. Because it is an animal and not a plant, it becomes diseased especially nowadays with all the pollution in the sea. The sponge just gets sicker and sicker. How has a culture which developed over a thousand years survived the shock waves of the last 40? What future is there for the traditions of the family and the church, the two pillars of this community, as of many others like it? In fact, the middle-aged and young Samiats are still surprisingly attached to the old social structure. I think Greece is a sickness. You never forget Greece. Especially for Greek, I speak about Greek people. If you leave, you are you're going to work in America or Australia or Europe or another place, you have all the times, always, the nostalgia of Greece, because Greece is something special. I don't say this because I'm Greek, but it's the one I'm feeling, because I'm Greek. And all, most of Greek people like to come back. People go to America, work, and when she's uh, nearly, nearly retired, come back in, uh, in Simi to live in Simi, to spend the, the last day in Simi, in this country. And it's not only for Simi, it's for the case for all Greece. The strong, strong feeling we have for the family. You know, in England, uh, when your mother is old and uh, is not feeling well, you don't uh, keep your mother with you in your house. You put in the home or some place and you pay. In Greece, maybe it's going to come one day. We don't accept this. My mother is my mother. I want to look my mother till he closes his eyes. Something mystic in Greece, the mother. We adore the mother and the father, the more the mother. And we take care about the parents. <laughs> this, I, I hope, is not changed. I, I, I like the idea to, to love the family. I hope it's not changed. But it's, I think it's going to change because everything is going to come same with her up. It's going to be you, the Greek going to start to work very hard. In Europe, the people work. In Greece, the people don't work so strong. Yes, some of them, very little percentage. If you start to work hard, and you, if you work and you don't have enough of the money you win, and your wife needs to work too, you don't have time and, uh, to see your parents if you're sick. Because now, normally, it's the wife stay in the house, and the, the, the men work, and the woman look about the family. From the moment the Greek people have children, they sacrifice the life for, for children.
κόσμος εδώ επειδή είναι το μέρος λίγο πιο μικρό που είναι ο κόσμος δεν έχει ακόμα αποτιστεί από τις ιδέες της νεολαίας της σημερινής This community is so small and so isolated that up until now the older people have not been influenced by the young generation as they have in the rest of Europe On the contrary, our young people have been totally under the influence of their families. And so we have remained very traditional. Things are changing because our young people are being influenced by the young tourists who have started to come to see me. It is in our tradition and in our blood that we keep the whole family together. The family is sacred to us. The idea of sending the older members of the family to a home to expel them from the family is totally alien to us. It would never occur to us to have an old people's home, for instance. It has nothing to do with money. It is part of our heritage, our culture, and our religion. However little money you have, to give an old person a plate of food is not such a great effort. But in England, we're a very, very busy society. Everybody's working, everybody's rushing around doing their own thing, especially the women. Here, it's a very traditional role situation. The men go out and work. The women stay at home and look after the grandchildren, and particularly the grandmothers. So the whole family is very much more of a unit. And also they all live close to each other. It's a geographical thing as well. In England, families are scattered all over the country. And the conception of not looking after their old, or their old it just doesn't enter, it just doesn't come into their, into their heads, their families. They stay together, they look after each other. Mum and Dad keeps us very close. I mean, he watch every, every move we do. We like it, because they show us the right way to grow up on the Simeon way or whatever it is. I mean, to grow on the, on the life and accept the life easier. So I will never, ever think to put my parents in a place and leave them like that. Because I know that if I have a problem when I get married, I get older, and all that, I can go ask them, they will do something for me, they will help me. Uh, and if they have a problem, I can help them too. So the family keeps on going all the time, all the time. We are together, share the problems. And it's, um, I don't know, because I haven't, I haven't lived the way that you live, so I can tell you the difference in between our lives and your lives. When the whole world is changing, it is natural that small communities like Simi will change also. It is the world which will change Simi, not Simi that will change the world. If people come here from Western Europe, our people will see how they live, how they talk, how they behave. And this will slowly change our lives. Not suddenly, I hope, but I know that it will slowly. There is a self-confidence among the people here, a strong conviction that their destiny is in their own hands. It is so, it has always been so, it must remain so. Economic life is subject to change. People have always accepted that. But the religious and cultural life is rich enough to persuade you that the outside world would be more easily changed by its example than vice versa.
there were many hundred boats starting from here in the summer, leaving the island in the summer. It was a very big holiday. These people, these people, they were going to the coast of Africa fishing the sponges. Before they leave the island, these people, the every boat who was leaving, one by one, there were, let's say, five boats together. One was the boat with the men, the divers. The second was the boat with the food. The third was the boat where they keep the sponges and stuff like this. It was one crew of boats, every crew like this. All these boats, they, left, they leave the harbor, they have to cross the harbor before they leave. They make a big cross on the harbor because many of them never returned back alive. They died. They died. Of course, we are Orthodox Christians. As we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, so we celebrate the resurrection of the Greek nation who were enslaved by the Turks for many years and were resurrected and gained new life. We call this Holy Week Great Week. When we throw firecrackers, it is a celebration and a joy. It's like saying all who persecuted Christ or all who persecuted us, the Greeks, will go to hell. That is the Great Week that we celebrate. A priest is a judge and a family friend. And that's why we call him not only priest, but father. Even this has started to change. Because when you ask a young person to go and see a father or priest, he doesn't want to, because he feels punished. More than that, he must repent for himself, for his family, and for his God. We leave Simi then as a rare example these days of a community that still keeps to its traditional family structure of nurturing the old as well as the young. We've seen that for Simi, the likely theme song is the times they are a-changing. And equally for third waivers here, the subject of adapting to change, finding a new place in society, dancing to a different tune, remains a pretty important one. I'm joined in the studio this afternoon by Eric Midwinter, a social historian specialising in the third age. And I'm wondering, would it be wrong to be sentimental about Simi and say, oh Lord, times are changing, can only be changing for the worst? I think it would be sentimental. It's likely that the old order on Simi, as elsewhere in in that sort of society, either the younger women are 
very burdened by having to look after the old people. All the old people are, if not exactly persecuted, at least, uh, 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 and probably not all that happy. Some of them. Uh, the, the great danger is to make uh, vast general assumptions that, that if families are in charge, if, if families are looking after older people, the so-called extended family, then it, it, it's better than other things. It's better than welfare and institutional care and so on. And that's quite wrong. Yeah, but in Simi they're also saying that because the, the sort of traditional work of diving for sponge, sponges handed to son you know, from father, mm. that that connected them. And I suppose you are, that keeps a family compact, certainly. But the actual culture, when it changes radically, like let's say the disappearance of coal mining mm. in this country, cotton mm. mills, mm. then isn't it the old that find it harder to adapt? I mean, certainly say to new technology at the moment. Well, I think that's true. I mean, we've got to remember, of course, that the coming of uh, cotton mills and coal mines in the first place, dislocated agricultural communities and, and older people were left behind in the country, rather like it's happening in Simi as, the, as, as pe younger people migrate from there. So, right. so change is fairly constant. And I think what you find, quite honestly, is that old, uh, some older people adapt and some don't. Mm. It, it, it's this idea that there's some kind of characteristic to do with older age, which is, holds good for, for all time. Uh, and some will be happier and some will be less happy. Mm. But uh, there are, there are. don't you think that um, uh, it is harder, though, for an older person to adapt when they've seen their life through a cycle, I mean, in a particular way? Well, it's harder for them to adapt if, if for instance, they haven't got enough money. Right. But well, most people are pretty good at adapting if they've got enough money mm. and can sort themselves out and, and be independent. Mm. Th there's a lot of uh, sentimental claptrap quite honestly talked about the older people uh, being alone in our society in a recent survey suggests that older people don't feel loneliness much more in proportion than other sections of uh, the community loneliness is an awful thing isolation is an awful thing for 20 30 percent of society including 20 and 30 year olds mm. it is a it's a social problem but but lonely people are not necessarily old people or vice versa and indeed close on 70% of older people are saying they've got sufficient social contacts. And what we've got to remember is that living alone, independent, proud, able to care for yourself is a tremendous mark of esteem and people are very happy and they're at peace and so on and so on. And they don't necessarily want to be involved with, with having to share a house and a kitchen with another woman, a younger woman who perhaps they don't get on with and so on. What's often forgotten is that whereas many families get on very well, Many families don't, don't and it's right. very corrosive mm. and, and unpleasant to live in that sort of situation. But when you've, you've recently been involved in the, ca in the Gas Council research, haven't you, survey mm. on? The British Gas Survey, What's been yes. the most staggeringly surprising thing, or are you so used to never making a generalisation mm. that you're not staggered by it, that has come out? I think the, I think the interesting thing that came out of it is that the, the, the marks of older age in the public perception ill health, poverty, vulnerability, crime for instance, fear of crime, and the, and the aspect I've mentioned, loneliness, mm. are not truly the marks of older age. They are dreadful spectres in our society, but they are not all that related to older age. For instance, about 78% of older people regard themselves as in very good or fairly good uh, health. Mm. Whereas we, we tend to think old means ill. Mm, mm. Of course, some of those are saying they feel all right because they, they've been kidded by the propaganda and they, and they say, you know the old phrase, I, I, I'm, I'm all right for my age. So they may be making a slightly wrong judgment in a sense. Nonetheless, it's a tremendous uh, uh, result. And, and I think the, one of the first things we've got to do about the whole of these issues is celebrate the triumph which has resulted in the fact that we've found a, the trick of many people surviving to live a natural old age. Mm. And if we could stop whining about it and what a burden it is now, the difficulties to adapt and, and all these other things, and say, oh my God, we've, we've, we've suddenly found this wonderful jubilation, we, this should be the mark of it. We, there, there's a, there's a 11, 12 million people over 55, many of them finish work, many of them with the families grown up, many of them will have 20, 30 years of life in front of, front of them. What a marvellous opportunity to realise all the talents and uh, reservoir of gifts and experience and knowledge they have. Yeah, and also to start again if they want to. 
Absolutely. Because if people are living for 20 years longer after a job and they're healthy and they're, you know, alert, mm. they can change direction, can't they? But do we have much chance to? That's, uh, that's the problem. I, I mean, the society hasn't yet caught up with that. They, they still think retirement is the bit on the end, mm. just mm. a year or two at mm. the end. And I think we've got to create an environment in which uh, older people, retired people, can find these new identities, can find this new lifestyle. And of course, older people are sometimes uh, as ageist as everyone else. Older people often play out the role of being an old person. They're in, in the way it's been portrayed to them for a you know, couple of thousand years, this is what it's like to be old. So they start playing the part. And there's a, what's known as a fitness gap uh, develops, a gap between what they can do and what they do do. Mm. And it widens as people get older on mm. the whole. But do you think that, um, that we are a very ageist at the moment? Or are we simply, as usual, uh, not worried about age, but a bit alarmed about age. All the evidence is that throughout history and in every society, mm. old age has been regarded ambivalently. On the one hand, there's a kind of respect and admiration for older people. On the other hand, they're a nuisance, they get in the way, what we're going to do, and we'll have to find a way of even getting rid of them. Mm. There's plenty of evidence from the 1890s, 1900, in the east end of London, older people being nudged towards the workhouse or the poor relief because mm. people couldn't afford to keep them. Mm. We need to study retirement with as much resource and depth as we've studied work. Mm because many people now are spending as long in retirement as they spent working. Mm -hmm. Well, when you've done that bit of research, I'd like to be the first. The scenery is spectacular and the food gourmet. Well, we sent John Pittman to Simi for a full report. There are those who say, once you've seen one Greek island, you've seen them all. Wrong. A two-hour ferry trip from Rhodes is Simi. On the way here, a formidable English lady collared me to say, this is our secret island. I trust you won't encourage others to come here. Sorry, madam, nothing is sacred these days, not even Simi. Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to Villa Papa Nicola here on the island of Simi. Um, I'd like you to treat the villa as if it's your home for the week. I'm here to join a gourmet house party for single folk in a villa high on a hill, very high. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. You're going to be very fit on this holiday because we've got 280 steps leading up to the villa here. So you'll end up with nice strong thighs and Tessa Sanderson will beat your heart out and Chippendales, here you come. In charge of keeping everybody happy is a cordon bleu cook known affectionately as the fabulous Francis. The cook itself is mainly doing the cooking and being a hostess, looking after the people, making sure they're having a good holiday. Sometimes one has to act a little bit like a psychiatrist, finding out what their little problems are and the reason why they've booked the holiday. Nobody knows who they're going to encounter, really, when they first arrive, no, do they? No. Are, are people a bit nervous about it? They realise when they book the holiday that uh, you're all in it together. You come as a single person, but you're going to mix with others. Every day Greek food can get a bit boring. Francis conjures up wonderful feasts with local flavours and the unlimited wine helps to break any ice. Mm -hmm. The only real snag is what if you have to share a room with someone you can't stand? You have to come with the attitude of knowing that there may be people who can get on with and people that you won't, but Two weeks is a very short space and time of your whole life. But it's your holiday. No, <laughs> you can get off, go and get on the boat and be on your own if you want to. Do you come looking for romance at all? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. Great shriek going on there. <laughs> Why definitely not? Oh, definitely the last thing. A singles holiday. You'll have all that at home and all the headaches and problems that you come on holiday to enjoy yourself. Oh, so you're saying you've got all that back home, so you've come here to get away from all that. <laughs> oh, no, you haven't, have you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't believe you're having this conversation with me. It's <laughs> 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 Well, I think... 
transport on Simi is a bit limited. There is a bus, but the best way to get off the beaten track is to hire a truck. Today, we're visiting one of the island's 63 monasteries. Small world clients are usually in their 30s and 40s, but there's no real age limit. Often, as the brochure puts it, there is a preponderance of females. Good news for the men, except, of course, no one is here for the romance, are they? Even though there are hundreds of day trippers, Simi is rarely overcrowded. But if you want to escape, sail away to one of the many isolated coves just as the ferries start arriving. Why did you come on this one? Previously, I've always been in family holidays, and now my children are off on their own, so mum was left, and they were encouraging me to go off and do something I'd like to do myself with company around. There is this idea that people, people who go on singles holidays are, are looking for romance, isn't it? What, what about you, Liz? Romance? Oh, uh, no, don't, don't come looking for it, but I enjoy meeting new people. And uh, it's nice if there's a balance of male and female on the holiday, but it's just enjoying the company. So you're saying if Mr. Wonderful tried to sweep you off, off your feet in one of those starlit nights, you'd... Well, I wouldn't turn him away. <laughs> Our group, the Villa Papa Nicola party, have found an uninhabited island. The moon is up, the stars are so close you feel you could touch them. There's good food, wine, music, a scene set for seduction. So, was there any romance? Well, do the Greeks like honey with their yogurt? John's singles holiday was with Sovereign Small World. It costs £348 for a week's half board at the Villa Papa Nicola and includes flights and ferry transfers. In this week's Traveller's Tips, we've advice on choosing the right Greek island if you fancy something different from the most popular places such as Rhodes and Corfu. For first-time visitors, Skiathos has an all-things-to-all-people appeal with direct flights to some of the best sandy, sheltered beaches and for the energetic and excellent range of water sports. It's also a good starting point to explore other islands such as nearby Skopelos. Likewise, Egina has easy access being just 40 minutes from Piraeus, the port of Athens.